Hello, my name is Philip Dawson and I'd like to talk with you about constructive alignment and learning outcomes. So in this video I'm going to talk about, yes, constructive alignment. It's a really core theoretical concept to learning and teaching in higher education. I'm going to talk about learning outcomes. How can we specify what it is that we want students to be able to do at the end of a course? And look at this problem of why don't students read the readings? <clears throat> We sometimes set students a tutorial piece of work to do, read this article, solve these problems, whatever. We'll call that reading the readings. And I don't know what your experience is, but mine is that they don't do it. But why? We'll find out. So we frame this video, as many of the others, with the phrase, learning is what the student does. So we have a focus not on what we do as teachers, not on what the students are when they come in, what their pre-entry scores were, what marks did they get in school, whatever, but on what they do. So what's this guy doing? Well, brings le laptop to lecture, 50 minutes of Facebook. Has this been your experience of a student? Has this been your experience in a boring meeting? I've had this guy in my classes. Okay, I skipped class on Friday and no one even noticed. Yep. I've had that guy, well, not in my class, because he was skipping class. I didn't need to study in high school and I got A's and yeah, fails first semester. I've seen this guy, I don't know if you've seen him as well. Okay, this guy's a more world wearied student. Homework worth 10% of grade? Not worth it. And you can see he's got other things he'd rather do. Optional assignment? No. I mean, I don't set optional assignments, I don't know if you do, but I wouldn't hold out much hope of students actually doing them. Paper should be five to eight pages long. Five pages it is. Yep. I've had this guy in my class quite a bit. Um, the other trick that he does is changes the size of the punctuation to be about three font sizes higher, which can often make things uh, bleed over onto another page. So a very strategic sort of student here. Okay, so if we go back to this phrase, learning is what the student does, uh, both the sort of fresh out of high school student and the seasoned beer drinking student, uh, sitting somewhere in this non-academic Robert character. Um, we can see that on Biggs's paper, and this is, yes, a copy-paste from that particular article. I've got a link to it there. Um, this student, at best, in a passive sort of class, our two-hour, 200-student lecture, at best, I'm going to want him to take notes. But any hopes that I have of him being able to describe, explain, relate, apply or theorise, I think are overly optimistic. There was once a time when higher education was filled with this academic Susan character, also discussed by Biggs. Um, I guess this is the traditional higher education student, the learning for the sake of learning, the enrolls in a Bachelor of Arts because they love learning and critical thinking, uh, not as vocationally oriented, but here because they want to be theorizing and whatever. Now, Biggs's theory of constructive alignment is that there are things that we can get students to do that will make it so that the non-academic Robert and the academic Susan are achieving somewhat closer to each other. So let's find out what they are. Well, okay, have we had this teacher or have we been this teacher who teaches critical thinking but assesses the ability to memorise from the textbook? Uh, you know, sort of going on and on in class about how you've got to challenge things and not believe everything you read and critique and analyse, but then having a whole bunch of definition questions in the final exam. Have we seen that sort of unit before? I know I have. And really, from our students' point of view, the assessment always defines the actual curriculum. And this is a quote from Ramsden. Um, although, yes, we might have gone on about critical thinking, if the student knows that the exam is going to contain a whole bunch of definition exercises, they can uh, very reasonably sleep through our ramblings about critical thinking. 
Incidentally, lectures are a particularly bad way to teach critical thinking, but we'll talk about that in a, another video. Um, if the student can tell that the assessment is going to be about these certain topics and doing certain things with these topics, that's what they're going to focus on. So, what can we do with that? Well, Big suggests that we can have our teaching and learning activities, our assessment and our objectives or outcomes in alignment with each other. Now, this may be a profound concept to you, this may be very mundane, but at its core, we come up with some objectives, what it is that we want students to be able to do. Sometimes this is a list of stuff we want them to understand, sometimes it's a list of things we want them to be able to do with that stuff that we want them to understand. So we come up with that list. We then do teaching and learning activities that achieve those objectives, not the fascinating, interesting, superfluous stuff that's also on our list of great things a first year engineering student should know, but things that directly relate back to those objectives or outcomes. And then we assess things that we've taught that link to our objectives and outcomes. And Biggs argues that a lot of those problems with the fresh-faced student or the beer-swilling student are actually addressed by having these three things in alignment. You set your objectives, you teach them, and you assess them. And you try and be somewhat reflective to change things so that they stay in alignment. You find that there's an objective that you're not teaching or you're not assessing, you might get rid of it because it's not really relevant. You know, you weren't teaching it because it was a terrible objective. Or you find out that it just slipped your mind, so you add it to the teaching and learning activities. You add it to the assessment. So this isn't a static thing. This is a very changing and adapting and moving thing. But at its core, we teach what we set out to teach in our objectives and we assess that students are able to do those things. So what is our goal? Well, you can see on the right there, I've got theorise, generalise, hypothesise, reflect. Maybe that's our goal, but maybe we actually just want them to be able to identify things. Um, what is a capacitor on a circuit board? Where is it? Can you show me where all the capacitors are? That's a fairly acceptable goal to have. I mean, if you are an electrical engineering student and you can't identify the capacitor on the circuit board, then you're going to have a bad time. This is okay. Identifying things is a pretty valid thing to do, as is listing or enumerating or describing or combining things. Can you tell me all the things that make up a circuit board? Can you write down a list? Can you tell me the um, components of some sort of balance sheet? You know, can you describe what a debit is? Those many definition questions at the end of an exam might be these sort of things. List, enumerate, describe, combine. They're pretty valid goals. You might be seeking to compare, contrast, analyse, relate, apply things. So, can you take this circuit board diagram and actually make that? Can you apply what we have on this uh, theoretical diagram into practice? Great, you can apply. Can you compare the function of the capacitor to the resistor on the circuit board? Yeah, well, how, how is what they do different? How is, say, one particular approach to addressing something similar to another approach? How are they different? Can you analyse this? Can you try and identify what the core concept is here? Or at a higher level, yes, we then get on to theorising, generalising, hypothesising and reflecting. So, can you come up with a theory for how this circuit board actually works? Can you generalise how this radio that we've built here might be able to be adapted to do other things? 
Can you hypothesize how we might be able to build different sorts of things? Can you reflect on your own thought processes as you were building this? So all of these are actually bits of the solo taxonomy, which is again bigs. Um, at that bottom level, we have unistructural, uni one, identify what is this thing. We then have multistructural. Can you list a bunch of these? And you'll see there's those four lines. Uh, can you list the main components in the circulatory system? Just being able to say a bunch of things, multiple things here, in some sort of organized set is a multistructural outcome. At the relational level, we're then trying to see how this list of things might relate to each other. So let's analyze them. Let's find which bit is the most important bit. Let's apply these four bits to make something else in, in a fairly structured way. And then at that highest level, we've got extended abstract. And you'll see there on the diagram, we've sort of got those four related bits. And then we've got some squiggly line off to some other theoretical new thing. Making a new theory. Creating something. Solving an unfamiliar sort of problem. Problem solving is an interesting thing in the solo taxonomy because problem solving might sit at a relational level. If you're, say, solving problems that are really similar to the other ones you've solved before, if you remember back to mathematics where you might do a lot of factorizing questions, you might have done a hundred of these, where you apply a pretty similar mechanical process over and over and over again, that's probably more at a relational level. But if you're solving problems that are really different to the sort of problems you've seen before, that's probably sitting at an extended abstract level. So we have things like the solo taxonomy to give us words and help us think about the levels of achievement we're after from students. So if we go back to this one, teaching critical thinking, but assessing the ability to memorize from the textbook, where are we on the solo taxonomy? Well, critical thinking tends to sit at an extended abstract level. So if you're teaching your students to do this, it's, it's hard, it's really worthwhile, and it sits all the way up there. Now, if, on the other hand, you set them a bunch of exams around the same content, but you're just assessing their ability to memorize from the textbook, that's at the unistructural level. My prediction is, if you teach at the extended abstract level, but assess at the unistructural level, your students are gonna learn only the unistructural stuff. Yes, our academic Susan character might be at the extended abstract level, but our non-academic Robert, who makes up the bulk of our classes, is just going to learn how to answer those textbook definition questions for the exam. So language matters. When we're setting these learning outcomes, please don't use a word like understand, because understand is vague and difficult to measure. But if you look at the learning outcomes for units, many, many units out there have, on completion of this unit, you will be able to understand, and then a list of stuff you want the student to understand. And then this is sort of the cheating way of achieving a verb at the start of the learning outcome, which is what you should have. So a verb here is understand, but what does that actually mean? Okay, so let's say you understand the lymphatic system. Great, I, look, I, I understand the lymphatic system for some definitions of understand. Does that mean I can identify it? Point it out? Point out maybe the components of it? List, you know, what bits make up the system? Uh, explain the function of it? What does it actually do? Or diagnose diseases of it? All of those things fit under understand. So understand is vague, imprecise, difficult to measure. Don't use it in learning outcomes. If you're discussing existing learning outcomes and they use understand, maybe take the opportunity to problematize 
understand and think about what level you're after. Do you mean a unistructural thing like identify, a multi-structural thing like enumerate or list, a relational thing like explain the function of it, an extended abstract thing like diagnose. Don't uncritically use words like understand in relation to learning because understanding means different things to different content to different people. So, in Australia, we operate under the Australian Qualifications Framework, which does specify the sorts of outcomes that a bachelor degree should have. So, graduates of a bachelor degree will have, and these are copy-pastes, cognitive skills to review critically, analyse, consolidate and synthesise knowledge. Okay, review critically, extended abstract, analyse, relational. Consolidate and synthesize relational or extended abstract. The line can be a bit blurry between those two. So here we're seeing that a bachelor degree outcomes are more in that higher end. Cognitive and technical skills to demonstrate a broad understanding of knowledge with depth in some areas. Okay, so broad understanding of knowledge. You can have a, a broad multi-structural understanding of knowledge. Um, I know this broad range of animals exist. I don't know a lot about how those animals work, about the differences between them, uh, about what makes a mammal a mammal, for instance, but I know broadly. I have some understanding of knowledge. I have some depth in some areas. Great. So these sound lower level. Okay. Cognitive and creative skills to exercise critical thinking and judgment in identifying and solving problems with intellectual independence. Here we're extended abstract. Uh, creative, particularly creative things do tend to be operating on that higher level. Communication skills to present a clear, coherent and independent exposition of knowledge and ideas. Communication skills are an interesting one. I argue that communication skills tend to sit on the solo taxonomy around where the thing that you're trying to communicate or maybe a level higher. So if I'm trying to communicate to you that this thing over here is a telephone, that's not really requiring a high level of communication skill from me. However, if I'm having to communicate to you the function of the telephone, that requires me to understand how it functions, how it works, and how to explain that to you. So that's a little bit of a higher level. So we can see that the AQF identifies areas within learning outcomes that we should focus on and that they're largely at the higher end. So with that in mind, can we justify the existence of a unit that's almost entirely unistructural? So a unit that mostly relies on our ability to identify and label and name things? Well, definitely. Uh, I want to be able to go to a medical doctor who knows the names of all of the parts of my body and can communicate that with their peers and they've got a common language. A first year anatomy unit in some incarnations will often focus almost entirely on unistructural knowledge, on being able to identify, label, write down with precision the names of all of these bits of the body without misspelling anything, even though these words are 20 or 30 letters long. To be able to tell really precisely that this pin on a cadaver or some other specimen is this ligament and not that other one that's really close by. Identifying isn't always easy. Identifying can be hard we can justify the existence of unistructural units. It's okay. If you teach a unistructural unit, you're not a lesser academic, your students are not lesser students. It just sits at another level on the solo taxonomy. However, we couldn't justify the existence of a bachelor degree that was solely unistructural. There needs to be somewhere to go with that. And we know that within things like medical training, you need that unistructural knowledge to be able to build those higher levels of knowledge. You can't solve problems if you don't know what the bits of the problem are. 
So higher level is not necessarily better. We can have stuff that sits on all of these levels. We can have units that focus more on one than others. This is all okay. So if we go back to this teacher who's teaching critical thinking but assessing the ability to memorize from the textbook. We can see that the problem here is misalignment. Not misalignment of the content, you know, they could still be teaching about ge complex geopolitical issues and the tests about that, but the level at which the engagement with that content is. So the misalignment here is within the solo taxonomy, not with the content. So we're still focusing on complex geopolitical issues. We're just doing textbook definitions of it rather than critical analysis. This is misalignment. And aligning can be hard. So let's go through some examples. Let's say we've got the outcome, which is to list the components. Let's say it's listing the components of that circuit. The teaching and learning activity is building with the components. So we're building things. We're picking them out of a box and making stuff. And the assessment, multiple choice question to identify components. Oh no, we're misaligned. In building with the component components, I'm applying that knowledge. If the students know that at the end, they're only going to have to be able to identify from these little pictures, is this a resistor or is this a capacitor or is this a piece of wire? They're not going to be very engaged in your task of getting them to build with components. And this is really problematic because later on in their degree, they need to know how to build with components. So how could we fix that? I would argue that if what really matters to you with your expert knowledge is that students can build electric circuits with the components, you change the outcome, you change the assessment so that they talk about the ability to build with components and you assess them on building something. If, however, what really matters to you is being able to list things and identify them, change the teaching and learning activity to showing them some circuits and saying this bit over here is the resistor and this is the capacitor and let's practice being able to identify those bits because that might be really important. Let's say there's a certain bit which will kill you if you touch it. It's really important you're able to identify that bit. So thinking about the alignment of this outcome, activity and assessment really matters. Okay, let's say we're going to diagnose problems. Uh, let's say it's diagnosing problems with computer software. Okay. And the activity is a diagnosis case study. So I present a case to the class and we go through the process of diagnosing that case and seeing if, you know, what, what sort of problems are there, maybe talk about solutions as well. Great. And we give you a simulation of diagnosing. Problems, case study, diagnosis, great. But let's say the outcome is solving problems. So I want you to be able to solve problems with software. And I give you problem sets and worked examples for the teaching and learning activity. So in class, you work through these sets. They're all relatively similar, but that's okay. And you're solving them. And every now and then there's a worked example to show you how to solve that sort of problem. And then I get you to do an essay on the cultural context of those problems for the assessment. That's problematic, isn't it? Sorry problematic problem solving. Um, an essay on the cultural context of problems doesn't relate at all to that outcome that I had, to the teaching and learning activity that I got people to do. This is misalignment. Although it's broadly around the same context of this sort of problem, it's focusing more on the broader, bigger cultural picture, which wasn't what I said we were going to do, and it wasn't what we did in class. So this is an alignment problem. Okay. So let's say you have this guy. Attendance mandatory, challenge accepted. He's just not going to come to class, is he? We've had this guy in our classes who, no matter what we do, won't show up to class. 
I would argue that some of the problems, some of the issues on the previous slide are the cause of this. Because he's figured it out. He's figured out he can be drinking beer rather than doing that thing we wanted him to do in class and still get through the assessment. My tip to you is that at the end of your units, if you're at Monash, your students get asked to agree with this statement or not. This unit enabled me to achieve its objectives. You've got to communicate this alignment to the students for them to be able to reasonably answer that. If you never tell them what the objectives of the unit are, then they won't know if the unit helped them meet the objectives, so they're likely to give you that uh, three out of five. But more than that, when you're doing teaching and learning activities that relate to particular objectives, talk about it. And also talk about how it relates to the assessment. And when you're setting assessment, talk about how you're assessing what we did in class. Talk about how it's similar to the thing in class. Talk about how it meets the same objective as the thing in class. So this is my tip to you, to get better set you response on that question. Okay, I have been using the words learning objectives and learning outcomes a little bit interchangeably here. If you want to split hairs, learning objectives tend to focus on content. So learning objectives are often the, at the end of this unit you'll understand, and then like 10 bullet points of the stuff that you'll understand, maybe the names of the chapters in the textbook. Whereas learning outcomes tend to focus on application, verbs, usually verbs from a taxonomy like that solo taxonomy. So if you want to differentiate between learning objectives and learning outcomes, we're looking at what can the students do with the knowledge for the outcomes and what's the list of knowledge we want them to know for the objectives. Okay, so I said we'd come to this. Why don't students read the readings? We want them to read this article before coming to class and they consistently don't do it. My argument to you is because they know they don't have to. Um, they know that they've gotten through most of the units so far without having to read the readings. Um, why should they do it for your unit? What are they going to get out of that? It's worked so far and Unless you can tell me in all honesty that people who don't read the readings fail your unit, which I would expect at least 90% of the time that's not the case, they know they don't have to read the readings to pass the unit. So my argument to you is to communicate the alignment of the readings with verbs and content of outcomes and assessment. In reading this reading, you will be able to apply uh, constructive alignment to your teaching. Those sort of things. And then go a step further and say this meets this outcome and it will help you in this assessment by how it'll help them. So communicate how the readings or the out-of-class work that you really want them to do will help them meet the outcomes and do the assessment. And an approach is to offer multiple levels of time commitment, particularly for, say, a first-year undergraduate unit where you've got this real history and culture of people showing up to class and entering the discussion without having read the readings. For me, one of the worst cases is when a really ignorant student dominates the discussion that they haven't read about. If we offer multiple levels of time commitment, we might say in 10 minutes, on the tram, to class, on your smartphone, read these two pages on Wikipedia. I know that's not what we really want. I know we really want them to read that journal article, but I know that it's there, it's the morning of the class, the class is in 20 minutes, they've got 10 minutes on the tram. They can read that. They'll be able to participate more in class. It won't be ideal, but it'll be something. But if you've got 30 minutes, read this paper, read these pages of the paper and solve this problem. If you've got two hours, read this solve this and create that or extend, trying to offer something more, some higher level. But at each of these levels, show how that will allow them to participate in what we do in class, meet the objectives 
and get great marks in the assessment. I mean, in a sense, these are kind of similar to what a lot of charities do now, where they say that for $5, you will be able to feed a family for X weeks. For $100, you'll be able to uh, create a water source in a village. For $1,000, you'll be able to do this. And depending on the resources we have available to ourselves, we're persuaded by the results that this donation has. In a sense, the students here feel they're donating their time to do what you want them to do. Show them what they'll get out of it. How will each level of commitment help them? Or you can do what I do in this unit and just offer one minimal but realistic level. This is a postgraduate unit. I'm only asking you at the moment to read about seven pages there. So that Biggs article has about seven pages that talk about learning outcomes and constructive alignment. And they're really great and applicable to your own teaching to analyze and understand those problems that we have, particularly things like why don't students read the readings? Now, if you want to read some more readings, you can have a go at teaching for quality learning at university, which is better, goes into more depth, but it's a significantly more substantial commitment. I would encourage you to read that over a longer period of time because it's a whole book. It's a scholarly book. It's fantastic and it will improve your teaching, but it's a substantially greater commitment. But at a minimum, read those seven pages of bigs and see how they apply to your own teaching. I look forward to talking with you about it. Thanks a lot.